Hello everyone, this is Tom in LA. Hope everybody's doing well. I'm going to talk today about Canto 19 of Dante's Inferno and try to provide a quick summary, synopsis and some comments about this very intense, very intense and very important Canto uh, where Dante takes on uh, his one of his most uh, prophetic positions. Dante is playing a uh, is trying to play a fine balance here between the fury that he was genuinely feeling against uh, the church of his times and how much they were uh, in love with the temporal powers, the temporal goods, and how corrupt they were, and his own respect, uh, there was also honest respect for the uh, papacy, for the church, and for what it represented. So as we start Canto 19th, Dante and Virgil are going uh, across the second and the third ditch of Malebolge, still within the eighth circle. In the third ditch they were going to explore, the sin that's being punished here is the sin of simony, which is the, uh, the sin of uh, selling and buying spiritual goods and uh, ecclesiastical offices and favors. The origin of this uh, uh, term, simony, is in the scriptures. Uh, Simon Magus was is found in uh, the Acts of Apostles, book number eight, and that's where uh, Apostles Peter and John are found, um, addressed by this uh, uh, character who was a we can we can call him almost a magician, somebody who was performing tricks for for people, and uh, he was jealous of the power they had to infuse the uh, Holy Spirit to people only with their presence, with their hands. So he wanted that power for himself and he offered Peter, St. Peter, um, some money in exchange of that. Peter obviously said no, he refused, and uh, this character has remained in history as the symbol for everybody within the church who is trying to uh, make a commerce out of spiritual goods. This is where Dante comes from in the first Tertino when he talks about uh, uh, prostitute in your rapacity, the things of God. So silver and God. It's time the trumpet sounded for you. The third pouch is where you are put, Simon Magus. This trumpet has uh, either the meaning of the final judgment or the meaning of the trumpet that was announcing the crimes of uh, condemned people in uh, the public square, or potentially both of them, because it's very often that Dante uses the same uses the same word or the same couple of words for multiple meanings. Now we were at the next tomb, having ascended to where the ridge hangs over, and uh, there's a second apostrophe here from Dante to God. Supreme wisdom, Dante admires the perfection of the just the divine justice that is at work in Inferno. Dante is looking down from this bridge that is uh, covering, that is uh, overlooking the ditch and uh, he sees that um, all around there are holes of the of the same circumference, the same size. This uh, uh, stone holes remind Dante of uh, those that are designed for the baptizing in his uh, fair San Giovanni. He's referring to his time as a priore, priore of Florence, when he had his uh, own uh, high political role. In those role, he was responsible also for some, uh, uh, to, to be present uh, when some people were baptized, sometimes even groups of people and adults. So he's recalling here, uh, real life anecdote when uh, one of which this type of uh, stones uh, for baptizing uh, many years ago i broke to save one drowning there and let this be my seal to clear the matter as always dante doesn't waste any words because this is a fairly complex uh, historical fact uh, it's a personal anecdote something that actually happened to him but uh, probably also a message that Dante wants to give that has to do with the content of this canto. 
In other words, he is speaking of a moment when, uh, because this kind of fountain where, where people were being baptized used to have a, a thin um, piece of wood on top of it with holes where they would get the water to then baptize people, wood or stone, that was an ecclesiastical uh, sacrament. The, the, it was a sacred property of the church. And Dante, in order to save the life of somebody who had fallen into the, the fountain and was drowning, he was forced to break it to save his life. There is a fairly direct uh, symbolism here. It's not only uh, something that happened to him, but also something that recall or reminds us of the action of some, somebody who, for his righteousness, is describing breaking something that is sacred in order to do something more important to save somebody's life. And this, from a metaphorical point of view, is what Dante feels he's doing in this canto. The sacred thing that is breaking in this canto is obviously the papacy, the papal throne, because if you already read it, you know uh, what he's intending here. And the, the life that he's saving is part of his, the, his feeling of being on a mission with the writing of the Divine Comedy, on a mission to, from God to re-establish morality and to almost re-evangelize people uh, through the Divine Comedy and refresh the message of the Gospels. So, from each hole stuck a sinner's feet and legs, the rest of him from the cuff up inside. This is such an imaginative way to position this uh, sinners of simony. Um, the reason for this contrapasso punishment is double. On one hand, they have a flame of fire, they have fire coming out of their feet and their calves. And this is very closely recalling the Pentecostal fire given by the Holy Spirit that generally comes from above the head. So he's flipping that around from an iconographic point of view and it's very, very strong. Um, on the other hand, the, the second secondary um, meaning or symbolism here is that the lives of these people and especially of the popes that he's going to talk about, were so much focused on earthly things, on temporal things, that they spent their the eternity in hell uh, with their heads and with their um, minds under the earth and their feet up. So there is a, a, a double, at least a double meaning in this type of uh, contrapasso. Another question could be why the reference to oil as flames on oil with skin across the surface. So here the quick fire coursed from heel to toe. This is probably, um, and this is something that I found on a, on a little bit of older comment, coming from maybe 50 or 60 years ago. The oil refers to the anointing uh, unction, uh, unction that priests um, generally offer to those who suffer the last uh, unction typically on, that's put on their head. So there is this uh, additional element of irony. The oil, instead of going on their heads, is going on their feet. In his usual protective and fatherly behavior and role, Virgil um, takes Dante. In fact, in this case, he actually carries him from the bridge to down in the ditch. Uh, again, it's a little bit of a technical device here that Dante uses to get close to one of these uh, souls and try to talk to them because it's uh, agitating it's himself more than others and the fire is more vivid than for others. Dante addresses this soul in a very blunt and uh, certainly not kind way. O miserable soul, whoever you are, planted here like a fence spot upside down, speak if you can. It's, uh, I stood as does the friar who has confessed a vile assassin, head down. Uh, in this uh, satirical tone of the entire canto, he's referring to, he's making almost the parody of, a, of the sacrament of confession. He's, that's what he's parodying here. The uh, lo perfido assassin that Dante is uh, 
referring to in, uh, in the vulgar Italian, lo perfido assassin, that came from uh, the hashish drug, that's the root of the word assassin, hashish assassin, that was used by this sect that used to commit terrible murders, um, and in particular, these assassins, in some cases, were punished in Florence with a, per a particular type of death penalty, death uh, sentence, that was called propaginazione. I'm sorry, I'm not sure if there is a, an English equivalent, but propaginazione meant basically um, putting the head and the torso of the guy under the earth, in, in a hole in the earth, and then cover it up and have the, the person suffocate. So in this type of situations, a friar or a priest would go there to talk with the, per with the condemned person, uh, the condemned person, and uh, they would be confessing them, but in order to confess, they would need to hunch down. This is the position, the physical position that Dante is assuming, and that is really satirizing uh, in this particular scene. The assassin who calls the priest back to defer death for a little while, because the assassin who is there is trying to delay the moment of death by talking to the friar. Probably this is what Dante means here. Probably is always a uh, given with uh, the Divine Comedy interpretation. And then he cried, Boniface, are you already standing there? Already standing there? The writing lied by several years. This, in fact, is makes me laugh. It's a very comedic and ingenious and clever way to put somebody in Inferno uh, that Dante really wanted to put in hell, but in theory couldn't because he was still alive, and that's Boniface VIII. His archenemy, the Pope responsible, fundamentally responsible for Dante's exile from Florence. So this Pope who is, or this person, we don't know still who he is, who is in the hole, by mistake, uh, thinks that uh, Dante is Boniface the Eighth, who, no who he knows is going to come there because he's due uh, soon, but uh, a little early. So he's kind of addressing Dante by saying, Boniface, is, is, he, is it you coming early to where you need to, to come? And the writing lied by several years is referring to the book of the future, the future that the condensed souls in hell have access to. You weren't afraid to take the beautiful lady by the sea, the beautiful lady being the church. Uh, after having alluded to him several times until now, finally Dante is mentioning Boniface VIII, the Eighth in this canto for the first time. Boniface the Eighth was, um, again, responsible for Dante's exile. He was a supporter of the Black Guelphs, uh, who was the enemy faction to the white Cherki that Dante belonged to. And his uh, papacy went from 1295 to 1303. We remember that in 1300 he proclaimed the Jubilee. In, uh, and in 1303 um, he died. So because the Divine Comedy is happening, fictionally in 1300. This is why Dante is making. And there is a little bit of uh, mathematics to be done um, in this canto about uh, uh, popes and how they fit in the in history, but we'll, we'll get to that. So this soul with his feet sticking out uh, finally decides to answer Dante. And uh, there is a couple of tertines where Dante mm, makes fun of uh, the Orsini, who were one of the most powerful families in Rome. Orsini, in Italian, also means little bears, and this is why Dante here plays with the simile or, of, of a bear, of a she-bear and the cubs. And he says, I used to have the mantle of power, so this uh, soul says, I used to be a pope, um, a son who truly came out of the she-bear, I was part of the Orsini family. I longed so much to advance the cubs that filling my purse was my great aim. He already introduces himself as somebody who, so, who was so corrupt 
that nepotism and getting as much money as possible was his first aim. Now, this particular pope, because of this uh, introduction, um, we, and, and contemporaries of Dante, and we also understand, that is Nicholas III. Nicholas III was a pope between 1225 and 1280. So we also are to understand that Dante doesn't consider the popes who came between Nicholas III and Boniface VIII as simoniac, even if it was, I think, two or three of them, because the, we have a series of simoniac popes, Nicholas III, who is this one in the, in the hall, the Boniface VIII, and then Clement V, who will be mentioned later. But already longer is the span of time I have been cooking my feet, while planted reversed, then he, feet scarlet, will be planted the same. For then a lawless shepherd of the West will follow him of uglier deeds, well chosen for covering him, etc., etc. Nicholas III here is uh, giving us a prophecy of uh, the arrival of another pope after Boniface VIII that he thought he would come here early. And this pope is Clement V, who was, a, according to Dante, a tool of French politics and uh, is de described as being even worse from a similar point of view because he was guilty of doing that uh, huge revolution that was moving the papacy from Rome to Avignon, to France, where the papacy remained uh, captive, the Avignon captivity, between 1309 and 1377. So this is uh, something that really Dante cannot forget, forgive Clement V for. However, something very important that comes to these mathematical calculations that we do for history is how, how could Dante know that Clement V would have died uh, around 20 years with, from uh, 1300, if everybody assumes that Inferno has been written between 1307 and 1314 or 1315. Somebody says that uh, there are two options, main options here. Either Dante guessed, because Clement V was uh, fairly ill and uh, it was reasonable to uh, assume that he would have died by 1320, or that uh, this is a later interpolation that Dante did uh, after having completed Inferno, went back to it and changed a couple of lines, because the final revision and publication of Inferno was in 1315, I believe. Maybe the latter option is the most likely, that this was an interpolation. In, uh, in any case, there is uh, this prophecy. So Dante is putting three popes in this, uh, in this hole, and he describes how this particular hole works uh, almost like a train. As soon as the new simoniac pope comes, the other one is squeezed down the bottom, and the new one takes his place with his feet sticking out, and so on and so forth. Very, really very effective. Um, he'll be Clement V, he is going to be the, a second Jason, as, and as the first, so Maccabees recount, Jason from scriptures, from the Maccabees, was, uh, was the brother of a high priest who bought um, his brother's position from the king of Syria. This is why Dante is comparing the king of Syria, this monarch, who was treated softly by his monarch, this one will get soft treatment from the King of France. In my reply, I don't know if I erred with too much boldness in my vehemence. Dante says, uh, I you non so si mi fui qui troppo folle. Folle meaning, uh, was I too irrationally mad when I replied to, uh, to this Pope saying what I said, because he wants to respect the papal authority, the, the title, but the things that he has to say are very, very harsh. And this is a beautiful, beautiful invective that he launches against uh, 
the church against the corrupt church of his times. In the Gospel of Matthew, we know that Jesus says to, to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of, of, to the kingdom of the kingdom of God. And uh, surely he required nothing but follow me. Neither did those with Peter or Peter himself take silver or gold from Matthias, who was the apostle who replaced Judas, uh, the guilty soul. There was no commerce there. There was no money exchange at all. So you stay where you're held, for these are your deserved punishments. Guard well the ill-earned gains that made you bold in opposing Charles, referring to Charles I, King of Sicily, that uh, this Pope was particularly successful against, uh, successful in fighting. And let's realize here something very important, which is Dante is not going after, in, in this particular canto, is not going after uh, one very powerful person of his times. He is going after the most powerful person of his times in central Italy, but in, in the entire church. So the, the beauty of this uh, uh, heartfelt invective against the church is uh, something that we almost have to, as readers, we almost have to thank uh, Dante's exile for, because uh, he was in a position to be almost completely free and completely honest in his writing if he wasn't uh, condemned to death in Florence uh, he probably wouldn't have dared writing these kind of things about the Pope uh, in particular about uh, um, Boniface VIII and uh, Clement V who was the Pope still alive while Dante was writing the Inferno so in uh, in the second part of his invective Dante is uh, uh, referencing the book of Apocalypse uh, 17, Apocalypse 17, written by John the Evangelist. This is why Dante says the Evangelist intended when he said that she who sits upon the waters was seen by him in fornication with kings. She who sits upon the waters is Rome. Uh, however, in the uh, book of Apocalypse, is Rome as intended as the pagan Rome of all the pagan gods, etc. In Dante's meaning, he's more referring to Rome as the church. And this is why the fornication with kings, the church and the, the king of France, in his opinion, were fornicating. She had seven heads from birth and from ten horns had drawn her strength. This is not completely clear because I've seen many different comments, uh, but there is a majority of uh, uh, scholars I believe that uh, intend the seven heads as the seven virtues or gifts of the Holy Spirit and uh, the ten horns as the ten commandments or potentially um, in in this case where Dante is talking about it is probably the ten commandments uh, because that's where the church had drawn her strength in the Bible refers to probably something a little different so long as virtue pleased her spouse which in Italian is marito, so really, literally, we're talking about husband here, not just spouse. And this husband is, uh, could be the emperor, uh, could be the pope, we're not entirely sure there. But uh, the message is very clear. Uh, in a certain moment, uh, the church changed and uh, started to focus on material temporal goods. And what moment is this? This uh, pivotal moment was the infamous donation of Constantine. Uh, this is why I, Constantine, ah, Constantine, what measure of wickedness stems from that mother, not your conversion, I mean, rather the dowry that the first rich father accepted from you. In uh, his book, The Monarchia, that's all about politics, Dante goes uh, uh, to the point of really articulating a legal case against the donation of Constantine and uh, explaining, reasoning around and explaining why he thought it was an illegal act for the emperor to donate lands and the temporal goods to the church. Huge lands, because this is, as we remember, when Constantine moved the headquarter of the empire from Rome to Byzantium. And uh, 
uh, a lot of what were the, those temporal goods in Rome, he donated to the church according to the Domitian of Constantine. We know today that uh, this contract, this agreement con called the uh, Donation of Constantine, was nothing else than a forgery. It was proven in the, I think, 1500 that it was a forgery created in the around the 9th or 10th century uh, in the Vatican to very slyly constitute some kind of legal grounds for the temporal power and temporal goods of the church. Dante didn't know that it was a forgery, so this is why he's working uh, so much in uh, thinking about how illegitimate this uh, act was. And he did have some uh, uh, good legal reasoning because, reasonings because he <clears throat> brings up the fact that uh, the emperor could not take parts of the empire itself and donate them to other institutions because he was representing the empire. So. It was a type of alienation of goods that he was he didn't have the right to do, Constantine, in Dante's um, opinion. But again, being the document of forgery, that we, we know now that all this doesn't, doesn't have so much importance. What is important is the spirit in which Dante is uh, uh, making this invective. We're going to find uh, uh, Constantine in Paradiso. In Canto 20, um, where Dante will go back to this point of the donation, and uh, uh, you know, but the admiration for Emperor Constantine is so high that he uh, ends up in Paradiso in, uh, in Dante's Commedia. At this point, uh, uh, Virgil carries Dante again in, on his lap almost and carries him back to the bridge and uh, they've seen enough and they move to the next ditch and we get to the, the end of the canto. Um, before uh, uh, closing this video I really would like to highlight or maybe make a little shout out to a couple of uh, websites that I've recently discovered and that I think are marvelous for anybody who loves uh, the Divine Comedy and Dante because uh, they are so uh, well made. I'm going to make a list uh, below my video and in particular the Dartmouth College website they have produced something of a Divine Comedy reader that is wonderful um, it includes uh, different translations uh, so many different commentaries for each canto of Inferno, Purgatorio and Paradiso and it's very easy to use so I would strongly suggest for uh, any anybody who's interested to go there and, and look at the different comments, different uh, thoughts of Dante scholars. And, and then, of course, if you like, come back to the amateur comments uh, uh, in, uh, in the, uh, my, our next videos. So thanks so much, and uh, I wish you a good week.